everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk. Um, I'm Raj. A little bit about me. I work at NVIDIA. Uh, I primarily work in Elixir and Rust programming languages. Uh, and you know, a little bit of JavaScript in between, because you have to. <laughs> Can't live without it. So I also help organize Rust Mumbai Meetup. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about natural language media search. Right? Uh, the first question is, well, what does that mean? Right? Um, media search is simple to understand, like you have a bunch of media that you have, and then you have a text search query, and what you want to do is you want to find the most relevant media based on that search query, right? And why is there a challenge in that? Because you'll probably see an implementation of media search almost everywhere. Uh, as an example, you can go to any stock uh, image search service, and you'll find an implementation of media search. Let's take Unsplash, for example, which is an amazing website for millions of stock images. Um, so over there, if you search for dog, you'll get what you want. If you search for red car, again, you're going to get what you want. Uh, but, well, let's try to search for dog in a red car, right? Because <laughs> a lot of times when you're searching for media, you have a kind of image in mind that you want, and you try to describe it. And then that's when you run into the limitations of existing search systems. Uh, now, a few, few of you might say that, well, you know, Raj, maybe Unsplash does not have the kind of exact image that we are looking for. But this is image directly from Unsplash which matches exactly to what we wanted to look for, but it did not show up in the search results, right? And it's not just Unsplash. You will see this limitation everywhere you find. And we are now used to working around this when we are trying to find images, right? Uh, so why, why is this happening, right? Why, why, is this why is this a problem? So the way media search is implemented in a traditional way is that you have text metadata that is associated with each media, each image. And then that metadata, that text metadata, is used to do the search. Right? But well, as we all know, a picture contains like a 1,000 words, and the text metadata associated with each can't possibly contain all the elements that the image has. It cannot encapsulate everything that the image represents. Right? So that is the exact problem that we are trying to solve. Uh, we want to describe the media, kind of media, what we want. And we should be able to get the most relevant media um, for our text search query. Right? Uh, so this is where I show you a demo of a POC media search that, that I've built. Um, here you go. Let's try the same search, a dog in a red SUV or car. You can see that we got the exact image that we wanted. And the images that have been used for this demo are 25,000 images from Unsplash. Uh, Unsplash provides a free data set that you can play around with uh, for research, for anything that you want. And you can see that it got the exact results. Right? Uh, let's try a few more queries. For example, coconut tree from below. Right? It, it got what we wanted to say. And the most relevant image is exactly coconut tree from below. If we do from above, that's again what we get. And finally, let's try a coconut tree with a pink sky in the background. Again, <laughs> it kind of got what we wanted. Uh, all right, a final demo, I promise. <laughs> so here's sun setting and a man posing as if he is holding the sun. Right? Again, it, it feels like it kind of understood what I wanted to search for. And it provided me with the closest matching media that I had in the data set. Right. So today I'm going to show, share with you our journey of how we built this you know, media search system for us. Um, the first goal that we had in mind while building this uh, was we wanted the ability to search media using natural language. Right? Uh, we had a couple of more goals as well, but let's take a look at how we cracked this, how we solved this first goal. Uh, so we were looking into how is this possible, how we can do that, what are the existing solutions. And we stumbled onto an open source model released by OpenAI called CLIP, which stands for Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. And this model is basically, it's, um, it's really good at associating images and text with each other. It kind of corresponds to the way a human mind would associate images and text with each other. And uh, the way it does that is it maps the, those images and text into a shared embedding space. 
so what this means is that it can take an image and it can find the text that best represents that image and it can do vice versa as well it can take a text and find the it can take an image and find the text that best represents it right uh, but how is it able to do that well for you to do any kind of mathematical operations on images you have to first convert the image into its mathematical representation right which is what embeddings stand for uh, embeddings are essentially a way to represent real world information into you know your mathematical space and let's take this image for example uh, i can say that well you know there's one dog and there's one car in the image so i can say that this image can be represented as 1 comma 1 and we can plot it in an xy plane as 1 comma 1 similarly this will be 2 comma 1 and this will be 1 comma 2 in the same way and now what we can do is imagine we have a different images with varying number of dogs and cars we can have so this kind of a graph wherein you have different dogs and images point, uh, pointed in the graph but what is the use of this kind of embedding right the only use is if i have a query saying you know i want three dogs and one car and image with it i can use this embedding space to find that particular image but other than that there's mm, not really use of this kind of embedding and the key point here is the type of embedding that you get really reflects the use the type of embedding that you get really re reflects the use usefulness that we can get with it and this is exactly where clip shines because clip is really good at representing like a broad spectrum of information of an image and of a text in the same mathematical space so what this means is you give it a text and it will give you an embedding which is essentially a series of numbers and then you give it an image it will give you another embedding which is another series of numbers and the cool thing here is you can compare these two embeddings with each other so you can see how closely your text is matching with the image and vice versa right um, so all right this is cool but how can we use this to implement like a media search workflow that that we wanted right uh, where well, the first step here is you want to create all the embeddings of whatever image that you images that you have in your clip model uh, in your data set and you pass each image through the clip vision model and you're going to get a embedding for each of the image right then secondly when you want to do the search you take your text search query pass it th again through the clip model and you will get a series of numbers that corresponds to the text right and when when you are doing the search you already have the embeddings of images that you did before and now you have the embedding of the text search query as well now the final step that you do is you perform cosine similarity search to find out what is the closest image embedding to my text search embedding and the closest image embedding that you are going to get is going to be the most relevant image that you have in your data set for the given search query and well it works wonderfully right as as we saw in in the demo uh, and the open ai clip repository in uh, in on github has steps uh, for doing all these steps in python uh, but the main question that we were asking ourselves is is it possible to integrate this uh, clip model or actually even any pre trained neural network model in elixir uh, right and we were trying to find an answer to this question uh, we tried python as well actually we uh, had a production web service in python whose only job was taking in image or media and giving out the uh, embedding for it but well we faced challenges because particularly while scaling it because it not only was it very much memory hungry it was also very costly to run right uh, so yeah we were definitely looking for a solution to do this in elixir and actually i remember the date as well it was i think 9th december 2022 and this date is significant because that was the day bumblebee was announced and open sourced right and it felt like the universe had conspired to find an answer to a solution because bumblebee was exactly the kind of solution that we were uh, looking for so we decided to give it a shot uh, just an introduction, uh, Bumblebee actually makes it really easy to integrate models from Hugging Face into your Elixir applications. And uh, I can actually show you, this is a test from the Bumblebee repository itself. Just one minute. Yeah, so this is a test from the Bumblebee repository itself, which shows how you can use uh, Bumblebee to get a embedding using Clip. 
uh, you can see how easy it is, right? All we need to do is we need to load the model. We load the featureizer, which is a pre-processing step for the model. And finally, we just call create a serving and then use it. And here we get the exactly the embedding of, of the image that we want, right? Uh, actually, this particular step that creates the embeddings, uh, that, that creates the serving is really powerful. Uh, NX servings are basically a way to kind of encapsulate everything that you want. Just one minute, going back here. Yeah, NX serving is a way to encapsulate everything that you need to do in machine learning in your Elixir application. And one super cool thing that it provides us is batching out of the box. So imagine in your production application, you need to do 50 search queries at once. That means you need to convert 50 images and 50 text to embeddings at the same time, right? And what NX servings uh, allows you to do out of the box is it will essentially batch all of the calls to the GPU instead of going one by one, right? And this does speed up things by quite a lot. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, the question that we were asking is, is it possible to integrate a pre-trained neural network model in Elixir? And the answer was an overwhelming yes. I mean, not only like looking at the developer experience, looking at the efficiency gains that we got, we decided that we would actually prefer implementing these models in Elixir than anything else. Um, so yeah, coming back to the goals that we had, the second, goals that we, second goal that we had was that our system should continuously evolve. Uh, what that means is it should know what kind of media it has for what keywords and what kind of media it doesn't have. And for each keyword that it doesn't have, it should go out and get the media for us, right? Um, the, another goal was that we should be able to add and remove media on demand because we, don't, we can't afford to have a downtime anytime we need to add more media or remove more media, things like that. Uh, and finally, the system should scale with media volume and as well as search requests. <clears throat> so uh, the basic idea to implement all of these goals would be pretty much the same that we saw uh, in the media search workflow using Clip. We'll essentially take all of the images that we have, create embeddings of those, and then when we, when we want to search, we'll do a cosine similarity search uh, with that. But the key to scaling this whole thing really depends on where you store the embeddings and where you do the cosine similarity search. Because we are not talking about a few thousand media embeddings here, right? These are millions, tens of millions of high dimensional um, embeddings. And doing cosine search on them is actually a computationally expensive thing. So if we are able to find out a way to kind of uh, do that easily, half our problems will be solved. And that's where vector databases enter the game, right? Uh, vector databases are specialized databases which are designed specifically for this kind of use case. Uh, you can store a lot of media, a lot of embeddings, any kind of embeddings in a vector database. And whenever you want, you can do a cosine similarity search or any kind of similarity search based on those embeddings, right? And we have tried a lot of vector databases uh, in the past few months. And these are actually some of the features you should look for in while choosing your vector database. And because this field, this whole vector database concept is kind of new, uh, a lot of databases are constantly adding new features and updating their uh, things, right? So the first thing you, need, you, you want is approximate nearest neighbor querying. So the cosine similarity search that I mentioned, it's pretty computationally expensive to do on a lot of you know, millions of medias at, at runtime and a lot of search queries happening at the same time. So ANN, which is approximate nearest neighbor uh, algorithms, they kind of do an approximate plus KNN query. Uh, so it, you won't get the exact nearest neighbor, but it is pretty uh, it, it is pretty useful, and you'll get what you want with that. Right? That's the first feature you should look for. Secondly, when you have millions and tens of millions of embeddings, your storage can kind of explode. Right? Uh, so a lot of vector databases they provide this quantization uh, feature, wherein which is basically a way to compress your embeddings and then do uh, search on those compressed embeddings. Next thing, if you have a use case, for example, well, you know, there's some media which you only want to show for paid users, people who are paying you, and there's some other media you only want to show for free users, right? 
In that case, uh, you need filtering, and there's two types of filtering in vector databases. The first is pre-filtering, wherein before doing the actual ANN, it kind of filters out all the media that does not fit your query. And second is post-filtering, wherein it will filter out, it will first do the ANN, and then it will filter out the things that don't match. And what you want is pre-filtering, because post-filtering, obviously, like y you can't guarantee that you will get the number of results that you exactly wanted. And so you should definitely make sure that the database that you're using supports pre-filtering. Right? Uh, finally, you need to check that the database that you're using, the search latency does not spike when you're you, you re-indexing new media at the same time, because this is going to be crucial. All right. So using a good vector database will kind of solve more than half of our problems, uh, but we still need to figure out the other things that we have, right? So based on the goals that we saw, we decided that we, need, we have a few different concerns that we need to solve for here. Uh, the first concern is that, uh, first concern is content discovery, wherein we need a way, we need some service to continuously look for new media and continuously make sure that you know we have updated media and things like that. So this service needs to interact with a lot of external APIs, get a list of media, maybe download it, store it, things like that. And it will maintain a table of the keywords that it has media for and it doesn't have media for. And it will constantly be running in the background getting new media. The second concern is that uh, we need to take each of that media that we are downloading and we need to index it. We need to create embeddings of it. And as I said, it's a computationally expensive thing. Uh, so we really need to be able to scale these two services independently from each other. Uh, and that's why the second concern is content indexing. Uh, you can, uh, we, we also do things, other things related to media, like creating thumbnails, converting them into their own format, things like that in, in this service. And to kind of synchronize between these two, we have a queue in between. And the final piece of puzzle here is the content search service, uh, which is essentially fielding requests in real time using the vector database and responding to queries in production. So let's see how these works work together. Um, the content discovery service will take media from the external services, do things with it, and add it to the queue. The content indexing service will pick up data concurrently from the queue, and it'll process it, and it'll add it to the vector database. And finally, the content search service is busy responding to requests in real time using the vector databases and returning the media. Uh, we really need to ensure that the content search service has acceptable SLAs, because that's what's going to be used in production. So in our case, uh, the first and the third point were pretty trivial to implement. But the second point, wherein we needed to pick up data from the queue like concurrently, uh, we needed to process it, and you know we need to. There was a lot of complexity there because we were using Kafka for the queue, and we needed to ensure that uh, concurrency is well maintained. We needed to do batching because when you're adding to the vector database, you need to batch your requests when you're adding because every request that you're making to add the vector database, the vector database needs to redo all the embeddings indexed so that the new media is updated in the search queries, right? So a lot of complexity was there, but like only if in Elixir we had something that would help us with this. Uh, and you're right, it's, it's Broadway, right? Um, not, not this Broadway, but <laughs> this, this one. Broadway, which is an exceptional library for building data processing pipelines. And it takes care of everything that you might need, right? It takes care of batching, back pressure management, graceful shutdown, right? You name it. Uh, it also supports multiple sources. It can take directly from Kafka, SQS, RabbitMQ. And all that you need to do is you just need to configure the pipeline, right? And it is just going to work. Uh, let me show you an example here. OK. Yeah. Uh, so this is a sample Broadway pipeline. And we have callback functions for each of the uh, things that we want to do. And up there, you can configure uh, configure the pipeline. You can just say how many processors you want, how many batches you want, et cetera. And finally, uh, whatever you need to do in your individual things, you, you just do it in the callbacks. You need to handle a processor message. You do it here. You need to message is processed, and you get it in batch 
what you want to do it in batch, you can do it here. So you, you don't have to worry about any of the pipeline stuff. All you need to worry about is the uh, business logic that, that you want. Right. So uh, another super cool thing that it gives is a, uh, yeah, so <laughs> working with Broadway is really cool. Um, another thing is you can get real-time UI for monitoring your pipeline. So this is an example of the UI. And uh, you can see how many messages have been passed, what is the throughput, et cetera. And all of this is real-time. So uh, what this means, OK, so what is this, right? Uh, so Broadway has this concept of isolated processing units. Uh, the first up there is the source of your data, which is the Broadway Kafka library in our case. It's the producer. Down here, we have different processors, which are essentially uh, the, where, where you want to do your actual compute in intensive stuff, right? Uh, then next up, we have the batcher, which is responsible for where the messages accumulate. And uh, then you get, it, get the batch of accumulated messages down here in the batch processors. And as I said, this is very, this is real time, and that is super convenient because, uh, for example, and this is actually what happened in our case is we had configured the pipeline, and then, uh, but it wasn't, we weren't getting the throughput that we needed. We couldn't figure out why. We went to the Broadway dashboard, and we saw that only one of our processor is actually doing any work, right? Because it's it's in red, so. You can see that, and then you can go back, fix whatever configuration issues you have, maybe Kafka partitioning, things like that. And you can come back and check that it has, you know, whether your change has uh, affected anything. And yeah, it updates in real time, and you can see all of your processors will do work. And then after that, your batches will start doing work. Uh, and you can always make sure that you're getting the concurrency uh, that you need. Right? So uh, yeah. We did encounter a few challenges as well. Uh, the first one was dealing with NSFW media. Uh, so the clip model that was trained is actually very biased. Uh, like it, they, they censored, while training the model, they censored the uh, NSFW stuff. So if, if for some queries, it unfortunately goes biases NSFW media more. Uh, so we, we had to figure that out. Uh, we had to learn how to optimize all these different NX servings. Uh, in our case, uh, we figured out that uh, you know you can either go with GPU because you're doing embeddings and machine learning, but that's again costly. Uh, in our case, we found out that the C5 instances in AWS were the sweet spot between the throughput that we needed and the cost savings as well. Uh, finally. Uh, for the media crawling, we had to make HTTP requests at a very high scale, uh, like thousands and hundreds of thousands of HTTP requests at once. So we had to kind of go through each of the HTTP libraries and figure out what was the bottleneck and basically make sure the configuration is, is correct. Uh, so yeah, that is it. One thing before uh, we leave I want to show you is the code that was used in the proof of concept demo that we saw. So it's open source on GitHub. You can check this repository. Uh, here, I've used the Bumblebee, Bumblebee uh, serving that, that we have, just you know, image, embedding dot, uh, <coughs> image embedding, which will give you the serving, and then you can just use it. I have also implemented a custom, yeah, a custom serving, uh, which uses Bumblebee for the models. And the actual serving that is there is used uh, is, is, is just custom written, uh, mainly to understand what is going on underneath. So you can see what kind of inputs are given, what kind of inputs are given to your model, and how batching takes place, and, and things like that. Uh, so yeah, this is open source. Uh, feel free to have a look at it. And yeah, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raj. Let's go to the questions. I see there's also questions online, but let's start here in person first. Hi. Uh, so recently, we <clears throat> we also had to choose a vector DB uh, and pass through the same um, yeah, evaluation. I'm just, I mean, can, can you tell which one you picked in the end? Uh, <laughs> so actually, we went from a few. Like, we started with Elasticsearch and OpenSearch first. Uh, but then we faced bottlenecks in that when we hit uh, like around 10 million um, embeddings. And after that, we went with VV8. Right now, we have VV8 and Quadrant both kind of 
uh, sharing the load between between these two. So yeah, uh, V V8 and Quadrant would be my answer to that. Yeah. We have a, actually we have two questions here. One was about the vector databases, so you just answered that yeah. one. Um, there's a second question. Do you have any information on the resources needed by comparing Python and Elixir? By comparing? The resource need of Python and Elixir. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, in in our case, the we we had the Py sorry resources as in what exactly is the question? Could you repeat? Well, the question just says uh, by needed by comparing Python and Elixir. So the resources needed when you compare Python and Elixir. Okay, so the answer to that would be, in our case, we found out that the uh, advantage that we got from NX serving, wherein we were able to batch requests at runtime, was really good. And uh, we were able to save a lot of costs and run the models efficiently because of that. Because in Python, uh, it's, very, it's not yet possible and difficult to do this. Uh, yeah, so the resource consumption was definitely a lot more in the Python side, yeah. Sounds good. That's definitely something I heard already in this conference that batching in Python is really difficult as yeah. well. Any more questions here? Then thank you so much, Rash. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>